Lovely. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be back after a small unexpected break. And I couldn't be happier uh, for the highlight of the week and the month to have our one and only Professor Neil Fox uh, on his uh, long awaited talk at the Rebellious Research Seminar Series. So I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to pass it to Neil uh, and uh, who's going to be talking for about an hour or so. And I'm going to have about half an hour of Q&A sessions towards the end. We have to finish five minutes to five because Neil needs to dash, uh, but hopefully we'll still have plenty of time for questions and answers. So um, it's after you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I got to leave at five to five to get my kids. Um, I'm on childcare duty, so I'll be sort of dashing off. Um, hopefully it'll be about an hour. I'm not sure. Um, the, the talk is in two parts. I've got a kind of scripted part and then more of a kind of preform case study part. So we'll see how we see how we go. Um, my name is uh, yeah, Neil Fox. I'm professor of film practice and pedagogy at Falmouth University, where I'm the research and strategy lead for a project called the Sound Image Cinema Lab, which is a teaching research and sort of production partnership project. And uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I am an illustrious company doing one of these, uh, following my podcasting colleague Dario, who's here today, um, who gave one recently. Um, and I just wanted to say a big thank you to, um, to Agatha for asking me to do it. Um, I think these are a fabulous a fabulous space to talk about practice research um so thank you and yeah it really is a it really is an honor to be asked to do this um throughout the 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 talky bit i might mention i i when i say i it's kind of referring to things that i did specifically but the the lab is a we um it's always a we um like any kind of filmmaking practice it's not one person so i've kind of become the spokesperson for it um just because of the the trajectory that I've taken, but I, I I speak on behalf of a team of people who've all contributed massively to its its kind of evolution and and, and progress. Um, and when I say I, it'll be around specific interjections that that I made at points because because I'm here. Um, all right, let's uh, let's go. So I spend a lot of time talking about the Sound Image Cinema Lab uh, in a lot of different ways to a lot of different audiences. Today, though, I'd like to spend some time thinking through what it is and what it does using the idea of rebellion as a provocation for that thought. So is it rebellious research? And if so, how so? And this is going to be the first part of the talk. In the second part, I'll look at some specific case studies and different interventions that we've made and how we've, how we've configured those different collaborations for different outcomes, both within the university and on behalf of the university in a wider context. I was recently asked uh, in an interview with a PhD student who the guiding influences were for the lab, and instinctively I said Agnes Varda, John Cassavetes and Werner Herzog. And when I told that to my colleagues later, they thankfully conferred that that was an appropriate response. Um, people often liken the lab to a film studio or a production company, but that's never how it's operated. The driving spirit of the lab has always been indie film uh, as opposed to studio and uh, there are obviously some crossovers, but it is a lab. Um, and if anything, it operates more like a traditional university research center than anything else, which might become clearer in a bit. And weirdly, that in itself feels increasingly um, rebellious um, in a sense of like universities constantly trying to operate more like uh, sort of private business. So actually having a, a project which is housed with a university with a research and teaching remit um, feels quite different uh, in terms of how these things are kind of going. So people can't see the slides, is that right, Agatha? It looks like, yeah, I can see the first uh, opening slide, Neil, but I don't think people do. All I see is, is NF, your little Monica, your little Monica, I can't see any slides. No slides. I can see the slide. I can see the slide. It must be you, <laughs> Might be me then. I'll leave. Let me try again. Let me go back. Oh, Alex, can you see the slides? I could see. I could see the first oh, blue slide. Yeah. Got it now. Got it now. I think we have it right now. Is that all right? I've yes. refreshed. Lovely. Thank you. Cool. All right. So when I joined Falmouth in 2013, uh, it was a real pleasure to learn more about the independent film community that was active here in Cornwall. It was really inspiring to see filmmakers just getting on with it figuring out how to fund micro and low budget work 
and distributing it themselves locally and sometimes beyond. It reminded me of what I'd heard about Austin with people like Richard Linklater and Robert Rodriguez and how there was this really collective approach to production, distribution and cinephile culture. I've spent a lot of time in my life trying to tell people that my hometown of Luton isn't shit. Um, and now I seem to spend a lot of time trying to convince people that Cornwall's actually like Austin, Texas. But that is kind of how it feels. It's a place where filmmakers and artists of all different ilks have just got on with the making and showing of work, regardless of UK national interest, either in that work or their perception of what they're doing. Now, obviously, the perception of Cornish film has changed massively in the last few years due to the rise of Mark Jenkin. More on him later, obviously. But nothing has really changed on the ground. The culture and community is the same, as are the opportunities and the infrastructure. And the Sound Image Cinema Lab is a way to support and cultivate indie film in Cornwall, both as a storytelling source, but also as a filmmaking resource. It is productive, I think, to think about the lab as a site of rebellion, resistance and innovation in both a film education and a wider education context. One of the main inspirations for both the name and the approach for the lab was the Sensory Ethnography Lab at Harvard, responsible for practice research work at an enviable level. Their highest profile projects are the works of Verena Paravel and Lucien Castang-Taylor, including their highly acclaimed experimental documentary Leviathan from 2012. Their work is highly research informed, it operates as research, and it also exists as commercial cinema, um, commercial in an art house documentary festival circuit sense, but, but commercial nonetheless. And one of the goals of the lab was to see if we could do something similar in a UK micro budget context, but also with kind of narrative fiction work at the centre of the output pool. Another interesting comparison, and one I'm not yet wholly convinced of, but I am interested by, is the LA Rebellion and its filmmakers. So the LA Rebellion, for those who don't know, was a group of filmmakers, uh, including Charles Burnett, Haley Jarima and, and Julie Dash, who emerged from the UCLA film programme on a course titled Ethno Communications in the 1970s. And for me, the comparison is around thinking how those filmmakers came from a research informed practice environment to make fiction work that resonated with documentary and experimental formal elements, but for whom the resonance and narratives of place were central, whether it was the Watts of Killer of Sheep, the African West Coast and American South of Sankofa, or the South Carolina of Daughters of the Dust. Across the spectrum of filmmakers that the lab seeks to be in dialogue with in terms of practice, those ones I mentioned earlier, there's a shared sense of having to find ways to make work outside of the continuously narrow parameters of formal industry funding support mechanisms. While some of the filmmakers mentioned at the outset have made work that's been sanctified by studios or high-end film and television, in the main, they made work using innovative methods, both in terms of film form and in the forging of production opportunities that were outside the norm, rebellion indeed. And those of us that make work within the lab always feel like indie filmmakers. That is my background prior to academia. And believe it or not, universities are not experienced or even that interested in investing anything, money or anything else, into indie films, even when those films win BAFTAs and premiere at Cannes. I used to make films and run and run a film festival in Luton, and that was hard. There was not only no money, despite it being earmarked like Cornwall because of its poverty and cultural deprivation status for singled out support to grow projects, but there was just a complete lack of desire to throw any money into funding film work. The reasons for that are beyond the purview of this talk. But trying to make cinema in Luton taught me how to think laterally in terms of getting money to do stuff. And often the way to make films or put on film festivals was to foreground education and development as the project focus, with filmmaking the vehicle through which to teach and develop. Thankfully, I've always enjoyed making practice work with people who have no experience in that particular field. I find it brings a wonderful energy to everything. It's inclusive and it reminds me that I don't really know anything anyway. However, not everyone can work like that and there'll be more on that in a bit too. When I entered academia and wanted to keep making fiction films, this stood me in good stead because I was well versed in convincing people how to support something that met their agenda or strategy, where it felt like making a film was secondary, because in many ways it was. Doing this, as in framing the making of a narrative feature film funded by the School of Film and Television as a pedagogic project, was not disingenuous or deceitful. That is exactly what we were doing. particularly when we made Wilderness, a feature film in 2016. 
shooting a feature film in 12 days with a predominantly student crew and skeleton professional HODs and professional actors could have been a disaster in terms of making a film that anyone would want to see. If we did, though, that would be a lovely bonus. The goal was, and largely remains, providing students the chance to learn in a way during their formal studies that is not possible in a classroom environment. So I convinced people to make the work in this way where the return of investment was pedagogic, but it also allowed me to write and produce my first feature and develop a postdoctoral research trajectory at the same time. So there was definitely a sense of rebellion when I pitched it because I knew that even though the pedagogic benefits were front and centre, there was also a selfishness to it. I wanted to make a feature film. Since then, we've continued to find innovative ways to access resources within the institution while constantly shifting the narrative justification for accessing that support. And again, there'll be more on that later. It's quite a lot later, it seems. The title for this talk comes from something the filmmaker Rob Curry said to me when we started talking about partnering on his and his co-director Tim Plester's latest film. I'm a producer on their new documentary about folklorist Doc Rowe, and the lab is providing support in the form of hosting the grade and the mix of the film in-house, with staff working on it alongside students. And the students will be invited into the mixes for the duration that the filmmakers on, are on site, which will be about two full weeks. Um, it's the largest scale post-production resource support that we've provided. And it's really exciting because the filmmakers are brilliant. They made The Ballad of Shirley Collins, Way of the Morris and Southern Journey revisited. And you may be aware of this Doc Road project as its crowdfunder made national news. And by focusing on post-production, it means we can provide support at a high value level that isn't financial. Or in financial in terms of providing cash, I should say. And it's also exciting because Tim and Rob are indie filmmakers whose sensibility matches that of the labs. And they buy into the fact that to make work with us often means making work in a way that is unconventional or uncommon. When I asked Rob how involved he wanted the students to get and what opportunities in the room they could look forward to, his response was he was just going to plonk them down at the console. And he said, yeah, let the students go wild with it. And this is where we've seen another form of rebellion outside our institution and in industry. While some filmmakers who approach us for support shy away once they learn students will be involved, others have taken the plunge. And as a result, it has changed both perception and behaviour from industry professionals as to A, what students can bring to a professional production, because they're often doing something key, not merely peripheral, and B, to what a university co-production can bring. Now, those of you involved in REF, particularly impact case studies, will know the value of achieving behavioural change in industry. It's certainly one of the reasons that the lab impact case study, which I authored, did so well. Testimonies from industry professionals, highly successful ones, put on record how our partnership had changed their behaviour in terms of engaging with the lab for future film projects. One of the driving aims was to create a model for working with film professionals that would create a behavioural shift in UK film industry, taking Ross Gibson's maxim to heart that research and creative practice can join effectively to make knowledge whenever their conjunction causes a shift away from ignorance and befuddlement. In this case, ignorance and befuddlement was from industry individuals and organisations regarding what an industry, what a university can bring to a narrative scripted film production, particularly in the micro budget form. If this was one of the driving aims, it wasn't the only one. The filmmaking undertaken by the lab is always in service of changing perception of what a film course, film department or film school looks like and can and should be engaged in both inside the institution and wider. Each opportunity to make a film is aligned with a concurrent opportunity to change perception and increase the scope of the lab. This is where the labness of it all comes in. These projects are experiments and they are testing a number of things. For example, they're testing the parameters of formal film pedagogy, what's possible, what's missing, how teaching and learning can be accessed through industry partnerships. They're testing the scope, value and identity of the relationship between industry and academia. And they're testing existing film practices as understood in industry and seeing how fit for purpose they are and what other models may exist. And after each experiment, there's an iterative response that carries us forward into the next one. Once we started making work where pedagogy was the driving factor in terms of engagement with industry professionals, in terms of what we wanted from those partnerships primarily, it made sense to start delivering pedagogic research on the process we were engaged in. 
This was an extension of work I'd started with my professional doctorate, which asked how film education might best address the needs of UK film industry and film culture. With university film practice education, the central form of education under discussion. My belief was that we as a film school should be engaged in narrative film production, and this stemmed from a love predating my doctorate of some of the narrative work that emerged from degree programmes in the US, including the aforementioned Killer of Sheep and work by Spike Lee and John Carpenter, as well as understanding from my indie filmmaking background that there is a dearth of opportunities to make funded short and feature length work in the UK. And one of the challenges was how to integrate the films being made with the more traditional written outputs on pedagogy that were written, written alongside the films. This is where Rod Stoneman's formulation of practice research as new forms of systemic inquiry that make their own processes manifest played a key role. In 2022, I published an article in Media Practice and Education that discussed the process of establishing the Stowe and Image Cinema Lab as a formal entity through the writing of the REF 2021 Impact Case Study which followed a period of years of activity. The article was titled, Without the Filmmaking, There Is No Research. And it highlights how we ended up understanding that in order to test the pedagogic models we wanted to implement, in order to change behavior, enhance student experience, build attainment growth, accelerate graduate outcomes, and challenging its existing industry practices, we needed to make films. The making of the films is what matters to us first and foremost. And the making of the films results in pedagogy, and research into pedagogy. The films are high quality examples of knowledge exchange. They contribute as outputs to the REF and the KEF, both as individual outputs and to the impact case study in terms of REF. And they're all pretty much always augmented by traditional pedagogic research, ensuring that the films can be presented as sophisticated practice research portfolios. John Mateer writes that these types of collaborations are evolving and the ability to conduct them is becoming increasingly fluid. However, looking at the revenue generated by even the most successful of these projects, it is evident that benefits need to be considered using other measures. Which is what is happening at more institutions across the university sector, not only where we are. We all have to be more innovative, more indie in terms of accessing support to make practice research. So having a single project that incorporates the creative voices of a variety of filmmakers with association to the university across fiction, documentary, short and feature that can be assayed into reporting on REF, KEF, alumni, employability and student experience makes sense in UKHE as it stands presently. I mentioned briefly before that one of the drivers is to challenge existing film industry practice. Research that is emerging from the lab in the next couple of years ahead of REF 2029 looks at this specifically, as well as the ethics of placements, the move from theory to practice for academics, the move into assessing students for their work on lab films and how lab projects help student attainment grow over the duration of their degree. The Indie ethos is not only in how to access support to partner with projects, but how to engage in different types of filmmaking practice once the support is in place. Another filmmaker whose work and process heavily inspires the lab is Avas Kiristami, and he saw filmmaking and teaching similarly, illuminating his thinking in the following way. My hope is that this will be a conversation, a dialogue. We are all links in the chain, ideally full of ideas about each other's work, hopefully flowing with empathy for one another. Non-hierarchical, empathetic filmmaking sounds positively radical when compared to contemporary industry practice, where overwork, exploitation, bullying and exclusionary practices are still rampant. Who would want to work in that way and who would want to teach students only for that eventuality? So the lab collaborates with filmmakers who are also seeking new ways to work. Behavioural change at the level of how films are made, not just who with. And there is evidence, too, of working with Rob Curry and Tim Plester, for example, that there are filmmakers who are tired of the narrow and stringent practices of mainstream industry and are looking to make work in more humane and compassionate ways, while still understanding the need for coherent authorial voices in nurturing collaboration. As Kira Stami adds, we are here together, which means the joys and misfortunes you experience will be shared by everyone. We are all comrades together. So what I want to do now is I want to go through a series of um, do for time. That's good. Um, I want to go through a series of films that we've made and just talk kind of really, really briefly about some of the aspects of each one in terms of how we approached it, um, 
what we were looking to get out of it, how it kind of moved the lab forward and different things like that. So um, that's what I'm going to do now, which will be less. I'm not, I've not, I'm not scripted this bit, so hopefully a bit more free flowing. <laughs> so makeup was a, um, uh, what were they called? There was that fund. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. Essentially, it was a, um, uh, independent film which was funded by Creative England and uh, BBC Films, BFI. Um, and it, it was under a specific scheme. I can't remember the name of it now. Um, but it was shot. It was a film shot in Cornwall. And we were invited to be part of the process of the production um, through kind of a, a series of networks. And this we were sort of invited to talk to the producer, Emily Morgan, um, once people had heard what we were doing in terms of this was after we'd made Wilderness in 2016. Um, and they were really interested in what we were doing, which is quite early days. I think Mark Jenkins had shot Bronco's house at this time. So there was kind of stuff where people knew that we were involved in the making of sort of feature length and sort of longer narrative work in, in a variety of ways. And makeup was really key in terms of exploring what kind of pedagogy we might be able to access um, with a kind of production that came into into the county and was willing to embrace us. So we had a number of set visits we had a number of time with heads of departments. So we take, for example, we take cinematography students and they'd spend a day on set. They'd watch the cinematographer in the morning. They'd have lunch with a cinematographer at lunchtime who'd answer questions and then tell them what to look out for in the afternoon. Um, we brought in people from that production to do master classes. We took students on set visits just to watch. Students were also in it as extras. Um, students shot the behind the scenes, which ended up being sort of officially released. Um, and it just became a really kind of key opportunity for us to be able to say th these are the kinds of projects that we're working on that are not just those that are generated from within Cornwall, but are kind of coming to the region to use um, to use locations and to use it as a story base um, as well as a kind of production base. Backwards was a short film, uh, which was the first short film we funded uh, from within the department. Um, it was directed by a graduate um, called Ryan McFall, who at that time had been out of the film course. He'd graduated from the film course maybe sort of 10 years before and was doing really well, still, is, still does really well in terms of music video and sort of music documentary, particularly sort of heavy metal and rock, um, and was looking to make a shift into, um, into narrative filmmaking, narrative directing. So again, we were able to develop a project where we could say we can fund this, but the requirement would be that you work with a student crew and also that we put in place some graduates to be sort of heads of department um, so that we could then pay those graduates to come back and take on a role that they were aspiring to, that they trained for within our department, but we're not necessarily doing at that level. So, for example, the editor, um, she was uh, working in a post house and she was doing a little bit of kind of edit assist stuff, um, but wasn't yet editing. So we brought her back again to kind of give her a paid job in that kind of career pathway and hopefully kind of accelerate some of that. And that happened also for the um, the, uh, the the camera operator. Um, and the idea then was to kind of create this pipeline where our students are working with our graduates um, at our graduates at a different level, but also working with professionals. Um, the editor on Backwards had worked on Wilderness and she'd got work through the professional editor of Wilderness um, who got her a placement and then she got that job. Um, and then she had a student, a current student at the time who was working on the, um, uh, who worked as her assistant on Backwards and then she got him a placement um, where she worked uh, and then he ended up working there as well. So there are these sort of pipelines that are starting to emerge in terms of supporting graduates, not just students and, and, and work, thinking of this about students working with professionals as well. Um, another aspect of it was training staff as well. So it was an opportunity to to train a member of staff who wanted to produce in production who hadn't done it um, and that member of staff then went on to produce and now works with Ryan um, as a producer uh, and produced a short um, which is being finished at the moment which will be out this year called the bird watcher and again it's kind of it's these these projects that this was funded um, using high funding um, and uh, it's um, again kind of really kind of incorporate graduate support staff development staff practice and we worked with a couple of other courses that we hadn't worked with before in, in an in in-depth way, including our MA prosthetics course and our BA, um, I want to call it costume design because I'm tired. I think that's what it's called, but someone probably correct me, um, which will be fine. 
because um, we've got to get it right. Um, so over the last few years, we've become much more involved in uh, Cornish language film. There's a lot of Cornish language film which is made predominantly through a, a scheme called Film K. Um, this was a, sort of a higher profile one in terms of its success. It wasn't the first one we worked with, but it was directed by Ed Rowe, um, the actor who was um, in Bait. Um, this is a really great project because uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Laura Canning, uh, I should say actually that the staff member from Backwards and, and um, uh, uh, the Bird Watcher is, is Dr. Kingsley Marshall uh, in terms of the, the, the person who's producing those and is now sort of working on feature film development and doing a lot of really great producing work and great composing work as well uh, for a number of projects, both inside and outside the lab. And Mapuda was a project that was sort of taken on in terms of staff support by Dr. Laura Canning um, and represented her first sort of foray into uh, production and, and film practice and she's developed a, a brilliant relationship with Ed um, a producer on his new short which we're also supporting um, and and hopefully um, part of the team that will, will sort of secure uh, development funding for a, his first Cornish language feature so El's, Ed's committed to working in the Cornish language which is great um, and it's been amazing to see Laura move from um, from theory into practice uh, in that way and again a lot of the research I was talking about earlier Kingsley and Laura are developing that as kind of lab outputs, which are kind of, you know, sort of different to the stuff I've been doing in the past few years, which is fantastic. Um, Mab Hoodle is worth mentioning because it was, I think, I think it was the first Cornish language short to play the London Film Festival short film programme and also played Encounters and had a really good run. Um, and again, has just been a great opportunity for a member of staff to become active in practice and then sort of tie traditional outputs to that. <clears throat> Uh, Spines is, is a another short. So for the last few years, we've we've funded um, a program called Graduate Shorts, where we put a little bit of money into um, into a kind of projects that are administered by our regional film agency, Screen Cornwall, and they um, give students sort of the opportunity just as they graduate to apply for for funding to make their first kind of professional short. And also for an alumni who've been out for a few years to kind of to, to get money to make something sort of bigger scale. And a few of those um, have also been able to sort of access through that support, uh, wider BFI network funding support. So Spines was, was an example of that, um, where we sort of put some money in for a graduate short. Um, Joe was an alumni, not, not, not a recent, not a first time graduate. He's made a lot of work. Um, and uh, and then the BFI sort of funded it as well. Um, what's interesting about Spines and worth noting is that, that Joe is an autistic filmmaker. It's a film about autism, um, has done very, very well on the festival circuit, um, but was a film that has a kind of autistic friendly, autism friendly uh, sound mix. Uh, and also he was invited by the BFI to write a case study because the lead actor in the film was autistic, um, is, is autistic. And Joe wrote about what the process of, of working in a kind of autism friendly set was like, and that's available on the watershed um, sort of Southwest network site. Uh, it's a really interesting case study. Um, and Joe's a filmmaker that we're supporting through the lab, um, you know, uh, he's Cornwall based uh, and doing some really interesting work sort of moving forward. Uh, I don't have a picture of Cara Mama. This is the filmmaker Sky Neal. Um, the film has just been finished. I wanted to mention it because it was the first time that we've sort of successfully aligned uh, a lab project with assessed work. So in the last couple of years, we've had a post-production and visual effects course come online, which is really interesting course and a kind of a bit more studio based than, than the other courses in the School of Film and Television. But there's an opportunity within it for students to work with sort of live briefs and sort of external partners um, and do the work of grading, mixing, um, with kind of staff supervision uh, and that's for as part of their assessment and uh, Sky who made a short documentary about um, a family um, and uh, sort of issues around sort of um, transitioning uh, and the challenges of transitioning within a family. Um, it was a short documentary that was um, yeah just just needed some support to finish uh, and Sky is sort of based locally and, and came to came to the lab uh, and the suggestion was the best way we could do this is to is to actually give it to students to be assessed on with kind of staff supervision um, and the work that they did was fantastic uh, and Sky's sort of testimonial to that account as the film now goes off to festivals is is kind of really glowing so that's really exciting to know that in that kind of post-production space particularly we can we can actually do sort of professional grade and dub work um, 
by students um, that's sort of satisfying sort of, you know, uh, professional filmmakers out in the world. Uh, this is an interesting one in terms of um, another academic moving, not necessarily from theory into practice, um, but from sort of different parts of sort of industry experience into directing. Um, and uh, Paul has made sort of two films um, rooted in archive practices. So from the cult, he was basically given an archive um, and sort of worked with that. And this is more and more work that we are kind of engaged with in terms of archive filmmaking and also thinking about the archive as a space. So we're involved in some work around Mark Jenkins archive um, and obviously the Doc Rowe film is is about an archive itself. So kind of from the culture is a good example of of a kind of short work by a member of staff made through the lab that engages with those things as well. <coughs> um, and then the Severed Sun is a feature which is due out this year. Um, and my colleague Laura was heavily involved in that, uh, a second unit um, director uh, and kind of involved in, in basically making the film happen. It was a really interesting example where through the success of working on a lot of feature films in the last few years, we were able to, to leverage resource for a production where we kind of create budget lines for our input to a level that allowed that production to access its kind of production funding and its cash funding. Um, so that was really interesting as kind of developing the model to say, actually, we can support, you know, micro budget and independent feature films at a really significant level through kind of an in-kind offer that has a real value in terms of the production. Um, and the next stage is to make sure that there is kind of equity attached to that, um, which is an ongoing conversation. But I'll talk a bit more about equity in a bit. Um, and again, it was supporting a member of staff who um, was an associate lecturer, uh, is now a permanent lecturer um, and is co-authoring a traditional output about the making of this film alongside Laura as part of their kind of yeah, what will be their research trajectory now that they're a, they're a lecturer. So it's hard to it's hard to not talk about the lab uh, and not talk about Mark. Um, and it's lovely to talk about Mark, as always. Um, Bay was the accelerator for everything, really. So we'd been making films in the ways that I've described for a number of years, including work with Mark. I mean, the, the relationship between film at Falmouth and, and Mark predates my arrival you know there was always a little bit of uh, sort of placement funding uh, for a couple of students on stuff I think dating back to Happy Christmas at least which was sort of 2011 um, and uh, he was a it was on staff um, and there was there was support for Bronco's house which was the kind of the feature that he made before bait um, and bait we came on board in a kind of in a way that we came on board with everything at that time, which was just seeing what was going to happen um, uh, and knowing it'd be a great experience for the students. So we had students on set, uh, we had graduates working on it, um, staff working on it, um, and just thought it was just going to be another Mark Jenkins film, hopefully one that would have a wider release than Bronco's House. But obviously what happened was hugely well reviewed out of Berlin, um, amazing festival run. Five hundred thousand pound box office before COVID, um, and a BAFTA. So what it did was it kind of shone a spotlight on what we were doing, made people sort of see, you know, and obviously it helped that Mark mentioned the School of Film and Television at on his BAFTA speech, um, but it also kind of turned the university sort of spotlight on us uh, in terms of like maybe there was a chance to see what we were doing as research. So that's in that conversation about can we do anything with bait for the ref that's where we sort of seize the opportunity to say, actually, yeah, we can formalize all of this in a particular project and it can form the center of the impact case study because um, the impact was so big. Um, the great thing about Mark as well, in terms of seeing these films as, as research outputs in their own right, is that there are kind of there's there's formal links between them, there's thematic links between them in a way that's almost closer to documentary and experimental work rather than the other narrative work that we support, which is made by different filmmakers, and it's hard to tie it all together in terms of a conceptual idea of what it is as a body of work that has content, um, uh, sort of, you know, thematic links. Um, whereas it's, it's it was very easy to to argue as a research project, not just as a kind of pedagogic project. Um, 
And of course, what it meant was that we, because we'd been involved, but not necessarily formally, um, and because uh, NS Main um, was produced by Denzel, his longtime producer, um, who's sort of coming back in to produce um, after being an associate producer on Bay, it meant that we could be much more involved from the start. Um, so we basically bought into the production of Ennis Main as equity partners. So we invested money in it, which um, has now been returned. Um, and that money now goes back into lab projects. Um, we're involved in Mark's next film. Um, we shifted from production support on Ennis Main to development support for his new film, which shoots in the summer, hopefully. Um, we're also involved in the development of Mark's next film after that. And again, all of those are equity investments. So they're investments that return um, to the lab and keep the lab sustaining because that's where the money is, is going to come from. There's no money coming from anywhere else. We do have other sort of equity partnerships, which I'll touch on briefly in a minute. Um, working with Mark has been really interesting because it, particularly in terms of like knowledge exchange. So Ennis Main, you know, was had fewer students on set because it was shot in that kind of COVID 2021 period um where there was just a real limitation on production so we didn't get as many students on set as we normally would have um but mark's work is kind of he's a very open collaborator and one of the things he's done is he shows he shows he shows cuts to staff so we have sort of screenings at the uni of rough cuts and things like that um and he also shows shows his work to ma students so he showed Ennis, an early cut of ennis main to students and i think two of the notes that he got from ma students he actioned um in the film so there's kind of in the film there's the specific cuts that that were from ma students um which is an you know fantastic opportunity uh, example of knowledge exchange in terms of that flow of information from students to to industry professionals and through staff um uh, a year in a field was another sort of high profile release for us which was um uh last year um it was released last year through Anti Worlds um, and uh, sort of premiered at Docfest. Um, again, was a kind of bespoke opportunity um, to provide what we, you know, what we could. Most of these films are like, what, what do you need and what can we do? And that was a case of, well, it was a very, very quiet film, very, very low budget, very, very minimal fuss, but it needed support in post production. So we had the resource and we had the staff and we had access to a graduate um network so we were able to provide all of that um um so that that work could be carried out very very quickly um and, and kind of in support and that was also produced by denzel at bosena um i need to mention bosena um because they've become a strategic partner for the lab um so a lot of the you know, Denzel is very central to kind of Cornish film activity, not just through his work with Mark, but in a number of ways. So we've been brought in um, as development partners on several of his productions, including the new Henry Blake film, Golden Radiance of a Beetle, which should be in production later this year. And then we're working with him and Bersena on a film called Lucky Dog by the playwright turned director Leo Butler. Um, who uh, that's going to be based in Sheffield and that will see us kind of taking the lab on tour, collaborating with Hallam University in terms of how to maximise the impact of working with external uh, industry partners, uh, which is very exciting. That film shoots early next year. Um, and then also we're looking to, um, we're working with the BFI on a, on a large scale bid around a number of things um, which are of interest to us here in Cornwall, which is the Mark Jenkins Archive and the Cornish Public Media Archive, sustainability across the film ecosystem, not just production, um, and community engagement in feature film development. Um, so they're a kind of key partner in terms of being able to work consistently in terms of like sort of high high end um, sort of film production and development uh, in, in in Cornwall. For our students and Denzel's on staff as well like Mark so all of his productions go into the ref that's there his research outputs all right I've got a couple of minutes to just tie up um to quick mention for Wilderness Wilderness was the first filmmaker in residence project we did back in 2016 it was also the first pedagogic output that um uh we um which which way which will put the, the the work of the lab as it before it was even called that into the world there's i, I like this picture because it's got my dog in it my dog died last month hello bailey um he was in the film what a star um and then uh we made 
a film called Long Way Back, which was the third film by Brett Har- third feature film by Brett Harvey. Um, him and his brother Simon been on on staff for a long time. Um, so this was again a kind of chance for new members of staff to work on lab projects. Um, and also th- this is kind of th- th- this will be the first co-authored output between industry and um, and uh, and academic staff, which will, which is a piece that Kingsley's just had accepted for the film education journal special edition should be out later this year all right so to conclude recently another figure who in many ways represents the sensibility of the lab in wider film culture producer ted hope asked do we really care enough about indie film to save it um and i like i love indie film i think it needs to be saved um i'm very invested in the idea of indie film and a lot of what we're talking about here i, I do believe is independent independent film practice um albeit in the in the kind of the guise of a university project and to me indie film as a practice a form and if we're pushing it an aesthetic is hugely important not merely for developing mainstream talent but as a cinematic space in its own right to me indie cinema can be seen as operating in the same mode as resistance struggles anti-capitalist anti-racist climate crisis struggles albeit admittedly without anywhere near the same degree of importance risk and historic oppression Still, the fight to save indie cinema is not one that will or can be won. Indie cinema won't topple Hollywood or Netflix, but that's not really what the fight is for. As Naz says of the reason he became a rapper in the documentary Time is Illmatic, hip hop is proof that I was here. And for many of us, this is what indie cinema gives us in its form, its content and its process. Regardless of outcome, it's an important fight nonetheless. We fight because the fight matters, the process matters, the process teaches us so much. What's that old adage that cropped up again about class struggle in Paul Singh's brilliant recent documentary, Tish? Oh yeah, the struggle is continuous and never ending. The indie cinema fight is perpetual and arguably has been since the likes of Cassavetes and Varda forged new ways and new images in the 50s and 60s. We keep going because nothing is fixed, nothing is permanent. There is no one way to make films or to do anything. And for those who say, well, it's small fry against the wave of neoliberal university, one Korean capitalist imperative, we say thank you, but we choose to fight anyway. And for those who say we can't be indie if we're in a corporate university, we say thank you but we choose to fight anyway. Indy is a state of mind, is an act of resistance. And as Benjamin Harbert said so eloquently of another subject I'm passionate about, music films, perhaps authenticity lingers somewhere within the commodity. The rebellion matters. That's me done. Thank you so much. It was it was absolutely amazing. And uh, I have to say, I, I know we had this conversation informally outside of this seminar, but your work is incredibly inspiring. It really is. And one of the things that uh, really stands out for, uh, for me from this presentation is how incredibly well you managed to combine so many different elements of what you do. So learning and teaching, uh, you know, supporting young filmmakers, uh, thinking about industry and academia, but also thinking about research. And I just wonder how you managed to to do it all and so successfully. What's the secret? And also, if you don't mind, a second part to this question uh, is is this idea of um, being experimental in a sense of exploring the potential of uh, especially fiction filmmaking in that context. So it, it's quite a lot. And, and there's not many people who manage to achieve so much in, in one type of activity. And Nora, if you'd like to join, because I know you, you're involved in all those, that would be amazing if you'd like to kind of join uh, in terms of uh, you know answering this question and what follows. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't realise Nora was here. Hello. And I sent the link. I'm glad you made it. Um, glad you made it because I was talking about how great you are, um, which was nice. <laughs> um, but it's true I mean I think the thing I think that's the thing is like I, that's why I mentioned it at the start really it's like it's only possible because there's so much buy-in from the people on the ground you know like I do a lot of these I do a lot of research talks now for universities and they're like well how does it work you know surely you must have all of this support from the university and it's like we don't have any you know we just you know it's all it's all on the ground it's all just like what do we want to do and how can we make it happen? And it's we're just very fortunate that we're in a place where there's a lot of people who 
that's the way they do things. You know, Cornish filmmakers are like that. And most of those, because it's a very small place, are on staff or have been on staff in some capacity as associate lecturers. Um, so there is a kind of core community of people that can make that make that step from they work with our students. Mm. So bringing those students onto set has been has been something that's that's really, really helped. Um, what was the first part? Was that the second part? I can't remember. Well, the, the first part I said that what you do is very inspiring and how you manage to just manage to gather so many aspects of it. So if I can just maybe um, ask more specific questions to do with this, specifically things to do with research and, uh, you know, teaching and learning, like th th these things are not always clear for some people working in academia, like how you can, you know, teach students how to make a film and at the same time get some research out of it. So how, how do you approach this? Can I answer that one? Yeah, yeah, no, go we it. Yeah, it. I, I was just going to say one of the things that I think unites everybody in the, the wider team and also at the university is we've got a very strong belief in not staying in your lane because mm. nothing interesting happens if you stay in your lane. <laughs> so I came through classic PhD academic background, my doctorate's in effectively uh, law and economics. <laughs> And it's only through teaching here that I suddenly had that realization of, hang on, things are more interesting if you don't stay in your lane. And I think for, for us, some of it's about the idea that the space where interesting things happen is when you as academics can put yourself in the same place as the students. That is where you're not the expert, that you're, you're, you're trying to generate something with them. Do you know what I mean? Does that sound about right, Neil? So, like, I got commissioned to do a Cornish language short film. Um, I've never directed anything before, so my immediate thought was, well, okay, who do I who do I know knows things about film? And the answer is my students. So, except for two, all of my heads of department were recent graduates, and every single other member of the crew was students. Because once you embrace the idea that um, staying in your lane is safe and you know, cozy and socially approved, and you can absolutely fall flat on your face if you don't. But once you do shift that space, that's when the interesting stuff happens. So yeah, I'm writing a paper about what it's like to be the least skilled and least experienced person on a set full of students, <laughs> while simultaneously being their course leader. <laughs> That is amazing. That is amazing. And I have to say uh, thank you so much, Neil, for using the word rebellious and rebel so many times in your presentation. Uh, I think it kind of uh, speaks to what Laura is just talking about right now, about this idea of not staying in the line and just trying new things and the idea of experiment experimentation you've mentioned before. Am I, am I right to assume that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's what was great about this talk really was like, you know, being able to articulate it as as a rebellious act because again we just kind of do what we do constantly you know but it, it kind of is you know and i think that 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 as well speaks to, you know one of the things that just to add to what laura was saying is i think that um we just don't believe that 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 there's a way to make films you know and i've never believed that i've never made films in the way that people say you should make films and I've made films that have done quite well, just in general, in terms of like, you know, festival and, rec you know, like so. Mm. And 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 those filmmakers as well that, that I sort of alluded to, that, that they didn't think that there was a way to make films. They just and they didn't have the opportunities to make the films they wanted in the ways that, you know. And so a lot of the people that we've worked with and Mark's a great example of that, you know, Mark's Mark's career shift, you know, Mark's success comes from changing direction because mm -hmm. of being unsatisfied with how things were done and he was like i'm just not going to do it that way anymore and there is a mindset of like well if we work in this way the students is not a proper film and it's like well fine well we just won't work with you then and that's okay but but good <laughs> luck you know good luck trying to find funding in the uk right now good luck making your short good luck making your feature you know there are fewer and fewer opportunities every day and all we're asking you to do is to is to just think a little bit differently about the production process and to just to open it up as well. I think that that's what I'm kind of interested in more and more is like so much of this stuff is hidden. And we've just we've been able to open it up to our students. And before it was hidden, like development, script development was hidden. We teach screenwriting, but we don't teach script development. So now we work on scripts 
we're development partner from day one so we bring that in into the classroom and you know often the opportunities to work when universities have partnered with feature films have been on production and it's been a resource suck it's come in we'll use your students we you know whereas now being involved in post-production means we get access to that students see it understand and because students are involved in key roles there's a festival and distribution element to this as well we take students with us when we go to places like being in berlin for bait and having students who are in the film at the mm. premiere like was an amazing experience you know they worked <laughs> on it they were in it and they you know like so all of that stuff is just about not thinking that there's a way of doing it but understanding that in order to make it what this is the other this is the other key thing in order to make it work you have to find a different way to talk about it so one of the things i talk a lot about to staff who are filmmakers at different universities is like the traditional way of you know, you you are you want to be a professional filmmaker. You are a professional filmmaker. Then something happens because there's no money, and you end up in a university. You still want to make films. It's hard to make films the way you used to make films when you're outside the university. You know, so why not shift your thinking and think? Well, I just I'll bring I'll bring the university in. Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways to do that. You know, all of our technical staff are ex industry. It maintains their practice. They love it. They just do what they do in a class, but they're doing it on a film set. You know cinematography lecturers who are gaffers who you know I was talking about this the other day like I would get when I ran on the big module in the third year I'd have a cinematographer who was a professional gaffer and he would be like I can't do my three-hour workshop next week because I'm on set but can I take the students to set it's like of course <laughs> of course you can you know you take your eight students to set because that's going to be more valuable to them mm. than or at least in that week and it's about understanding how it all fits together but it's it is a it, it takes a while for people to click, but but ultimately, what what is what is changing people's perceptions around this is the fact that there are, there's just so much frustration with not making work. That's mm -hmm. what we benefit from. Is like so many people around are stuck in development. They're stuck trying to move from a short to a feature. They're mm -hmm. stuck trying to get more funding for a short. Like everyone's stuck because there's no opportunities, and that frustration is leading people to go, "Oh, let's just do it," <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and then they go. Oh, that was really fun. And the students were great. And working with the university is great. I'll just keep doing this. And we're like, yeah, it is, isn't it? You know, and that's where that behavioural change has come in as well. That's I don't amazing. Want to talk too long. No, no, it's it's so inspiring. I know there are two questions. I just if if that's okay, I'm just gonna quickly comment because it's so positive and you know, here uh, hearing you speak and Laura uh, kind of adding to what she's saying, it's it's just genuinely uh, like soul lifting because obviously we need more things like that happening across the board. Uh, nationally and internationally because that's really positive and this idea of teaching something creative is a complex thing because you need you do need to teach students some things which need to be there but at the same time you want to encourage them to be creative and and think differently and again if you map it against the requirements of research is it's exactly the same it's this original contribution to knowledge but yes you still frame it within some expectations which are there for any kind of research so it is quite amazing of uh, you know uh, in terms of how you manage that and how you uh, use the challenge as an opportunity in such a positive way and it, it's just just really brilliant so i'm going to stop because uh, i know there's lots of people uh asking questions so lizzie i think you were first if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question that would be great hi yes thank you very much neil can you hear me yeah yeah good thank you yes that was um very inspiring um and great to hear about everything you've been doing um I had a couple of questions. Um, one is about um, the management of this kind of work. Um, obviously, it's different across different institutions. I mean, where I work at Sussex, it's much more of a humanities um, media studies department with a kind of smaller practice uh, section. So it's a kind of different sort of institution. But I'm wondering, so there's two questions really. One is around and I don't know how many students you have in a module, for instance, but one is around. So if you've got a certain number of students, which maybe is a minority potentially who are involved in a professional production, you know, in a way, what happens to the others? <laughs> uh, how do you include everyone on a module who's supposed to be getting the same uh, attention and learning if, you know, a, you're maybe having to select people who have the most potential maybe to be a DOP or an editor or whatever. Um, and, you know, how do you include them is one question. Um, 
and and also I guess the conflict potentially between the sort of needs of course in terms of what you're supposed to be what students are supposed to be learning and the needs of a production which I mean I can see there's very positive synergies in what you're doing which is great because you're a film school I think as well the second question I was kind of interested in the examples of the films that you chose you mentioned various women directors at the beginning but all your examples except one were directed by men I noticed and as a woman director myself I felt oh well, that's a pity I mean I'd be interested to know given obviously what we know about the industry and one of the main issues one of the issues is around inclusion and equality and the you know severe lack of it in in yeah. both and all of the film sector including the indie sector what how you address those issues in terms of as you say behavioral change within the industry so a big question sorry <laughs> no no great great questions great questions um I'd, I'd like to bring laura in on this in terms of student stuff um as the course leader i'll talk very quickly about it i mean it's a it's 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 long been a challenge the stuff is this very little of this is assessed work so it sits outside its enhancement um and there is a challenge on kind of getting more than the same students to apply and that's around kind of confidence i think you know like so much of it is just students listening to like oh come and get involved in this thing and just instantly thinking that's not for me and those students are generally from a working class background or they're cornish you know there's a kind of sense of in, instant like well this is not for us this is for the the high flying you know creative industries family students um you know so that's a job of work and that is something that i am constantly asking for in terms of time like can we have the time to spend work but it, that's 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 obviously an issue in terms of um i can speak the to this you like to, sorry i can speak to the, the teaching yeah you come in there and then i'll come back yeah. in on the other ones yeah. so i've got about 320 film students there are about 110 120 television students there are about 40 post-production visual effects students there are about 25 ma students there are a hundred and something animation students. So we've got a school that tends to be uh, like 750, 800 students. Because it's not assessed work in the main, apart from the PPVFX course, which has been set up specifically around a certain amount, it is very much what we would consider an enhancement activity. But there's two aspects. One is it's something that is actually a massive recruitment draw for students because it's something that really you know lands with students when I can say to them I you see that ambassador that student ambassador you just met they just worked on a feature with me whatever it might be so we tend to it tends to be slightly self-selecting in that students who really want to avail of this kind of opportunity tend to apply here but you're right there's no way to establish parity but what we can do is kind of multiple multiply fold elements of production in. So for example, um, on Paul Pri, which is Edward Rowe's follow-up to Mab Hoodle and the feature we're also developing, and pulling students from all those courses in as sign-up activities, but they're looking at different elements of the project based on what they're interested in. So the producer and Ed and I, for example, will walk through what the BFI funding application looks like for students who are more interested in producing. Screenwriters are really interested in unpacking the script and thinking about how it gets developed as a feature. Uh, cinematography students or sound students are much more interested in on-set experience. So we, we do calls for calls for roles. And what we will do is we shortlist internally and then the, the crew, if you like, the producers and the heads of departments specifically make the final decision about who's actually on board. That shortlisting process, it's interesting. Once you've done it for a long time, you start seeing that it sometimes can be slightly the same students. So one of the things I'm very consciously doing this year is I'm going back into first year a lot to try and lay the track and I'm bringing second year students who've worked on things back into first years to talk about their learning gain, things like that. I'm trying to integrate it much more at a, if you like, managerial level almost with student experience. The other thing is there is, a, as Neil pointed out, there's a bigger piece of work here that has to be done. And I'm planning to do it with Kat, Dr. Kat Flint Nickel, who's a, a new entrant to the team. 
there's a bigger piece of work that needs to be done around what kind of opportunities and what kind of advancement long term that students see from being on placements like this. And to me, a very key part of that is also around uh, things like gender and things like class and, and regionality. So trying to track impact like that, I think, is increasingly going to be the focus of some of our work over the next while. In terms of female filmmakers, yeah, I think some of it is is we just haven't shown some films today, like The Tape, for example, would be a good example of a, a feature film directed by female filmmaker some of the ones you, you that didn't in, you didn't send me any i did ask you for i your was behind too the scenes. late i was going to include your film laura but you didn't <laughs> send was, me the stuff i was I'm in a meeting <laughs> i was in a meeting so yeah i i also am someone as a female filmmaker who has kind of come through the lab um you know and the lab sort of developed me if you like and then i started developing the students so i think part I think, of it's yeah. just seeing it as that kind of mechanism you know yeah sorry to no. I just wanted to add to that because I think it's really key. I think that one of the I think you're right, Lizzie, to point that out. And it's something that we've, we've actively addressed in the last few years. But because of what exists already in indie film and industry, the opportunity to make work in that past 10 years has aligned with male filmmakers of a certain experience uh, with a certain with projects ready to go. You know, so we have worked alongside and, and in that, but obviously and a, we've got a lot of projects in development. There's a lot of short film work, you know, which again, but that is something that is, I think, by the time of the next ref, the slides will look very different, <laughs> you know, because it is a concerted, it's a concerted thing. And I think that you're, you're right to, to pull it up because it, it is, it is a kind of, it does rankle that as a thing, it looks very similar to what a lot of, the, the industry both as an indie indie sector looks like um unfortunately in order to be able to make that work in the first place it fell within a certain degree. i think the other thing as well is that we do take a very the, the the pathway thing is important we do try and pull students from pathways that they've got experience in wherever possible and that on on the you know again it's very auteur driven isn't it you know if you look at this at the level of directors there's a lot of men but if you look at the the spread of students that are on those projects and also the key roles it is more balanced, you know, we do have very much the kind of approach like the Professor Alison Pierce approach of like filmmaking is not directing, you know, like and it's not just a way of saying, oh, but it is saying, OK, well, cinematographers, producers, editors, you know, wherever possible, we are promoting women into those kinds of heads of department roles um, and, 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 and trying to bring graduates back, particularly, you know, being very active in those things. So doesn't look great. Um, you're right to bring it up and hold us to account, but well, I think getting away from the hotel, I think getting away from the hotel would be a well. Big that would be nice, wouldn't it? Contribution you know, to that, yeah. wouldn't it? Really? I would. I would <laughs> like to not have slides where you put the director's name on. <laughs> um, as a screenwriter myself, yeah. I'm like, come on. It, it um, is really interesting, though, to note that one of the things is we all know, for example, camera departments are highly dude bro heavy. Um, to a wildly exclusionary standard, and this is the case for, for um, you know, the, the industry across the world. It's not just a UK thing. And one of the interesting things we found was that once we consciously and explicitly started paying a lot of attention to that in, in the cinematography approach and also embedding it in teaching around practice and making, making things like um, striving for gender and racial equality in production, like a manifest part of the teaching, that it started to shift. And so far, all of our most successful camera department graduates so far have been female um, and have gone on to take, you know, the kinds of placement that they need to be on, whether it's Mark Milsom or BBC or Channel 4 or camera traineeships or, you know, so it does show, I think, you know, one of the readings we make them do in first year is the pipeline full of Weinstein's reading by, um, uh, I can't remember her name, but again, we we very manifestly kind of attempt to help them unpick that really early on in the process. Anyway, but I'm sure everyone does. I don't know why I'm being saying. But that, but that's a good point. That's a good point in terms of that the course has a real, really strong kind of theory component. So there there is a kind of constant critiquing and of the practices that we're actually engaged in. Uh, alongside the making of the stuff, which is key. Yeah. Thank Wonderful. you, Lizzie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alex have been waiting for quite some time. So um, if you want to ask your question, Alex, thank you. No, no worries. I, I have um, poor network quality. I can. I hope you can hear me. Okay. 
can hear you. Um, right. I have two questions. Um, how do you these days? How do you define um, micro budget? As in, what range are we talking about? Because it's probably. Um, I think I'm uh, under under sort of three hundred thousand, really. Um, under oh, under four hundred thousand, I think, is the figure that keeps coming up to me these days from other people yeah. talking about micro budget. So we ours is kind of around sort of three to four hundred, the the bigger end of the micro budget. Most of the stuff is way below that. So, you know, the tape, wilderness, long way back. You know, sub six figures in terms of production. Um, Mark obviously sits outside this now, but. You know, he's kind of the only one um, in terms of that. Those films today, they're all I think even Severed Sun would be under would be micro budget. I think, you know, I'm not sure. Yes. Um, but yeah, sort of. Yeah. So sort of around sort of three to four hundred accepted, figure, which I which I also imagine will change within the next five years to be under two. You know, in terms of like the amount of money that's flowing around for, for production. Um, yeah. Was there another question? Yeah, yeah no, no. Or was it just because I thought you had two or or was it just that? Alex? I don't know if Alex can hear us. I'm just going to move into onto Tom if that's okay. Tom? Oh Tim. sorry, Tim. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Hello, Tim. Nice to see you. I know Tim. Tim used to work at Falmouth. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, a couple of questions. Just listening to the conversation is really interesting, um, and I think what you're doing is is fantastic. And, and I'm thinking of doing something similar, or not similar, just making a film basically out of your, but not this year. It'll be have to be next year. I'm too busy this year. Um, but what struck me was the, the 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 notion of of behavioral change and and empathetic filmmaking. Um, uh, that's um, quite a striking uh, concept. Indie films been around forever, um, pretty much. So, I mean, how in terms of behavioural change, do you, what's your vision? Where do you see that going? How do you see that change manifesting? Um, that's a very good question. What, so, the thing that I always get asked because uh, that piece, the media practice and education piece that I wrote. And I, it gets brought up every time I do a talk at a university and they will say what because in it I use the phrase um, compassionate critique about working, particularly the impact case study, you know, the idea of like when we when you do an impact case study, when you work on the ref, like you are um, uh, you're not treated like a human being. You know, you're just not treated like a human being. It's a really dehumanizing process. Um, and it reminds me of a lot of the kind of conversations you have around film, you know, like you're not treated like a human being, you're treated like a cog, you treat like someone who's got function, you treat like someone who's, you know, basically told to just to do something very, you know, and not, and it's not always clear. Um, there is no, there's very little compassion, but I've always made films where I know that the people I'm working with don't really know what they're doing. And it allows me to admit that I don't really know what I'm doing. And in order to get the thing made, you can't assume that they know what they're doing. So it just changes how you treat them. And also when you ask people to um, work in this way, you're saying like, we need you to teach these people. So you are a filmmaker, that's what you do. But in this space, you're also a teacher because, and you don't have to, you know, it's just doing the thing and being open and, answering questions which you might find annoying um, but that's part of it you you know and I just don't understand none of us do none of us understand why you have why films are made the way they're made like when when our when, when our graduates come back and they've worked in industry for six months they just they just can't believe it they can't believe that that's what they were expected how long they were expected to work how they were expected to drive to different places after an 18 hour shift, um, how they were talked to, um, you know, the, 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 the food, they were given, like everything was just like, and they're like, and they say to us like, you, you told us this was what it's going to be like, but we can't quite believe it. It's like, no, you can't quite believe it. Um, but 
you know, there are also thousands and thousands and thousands of examples of films that are not made that way. And it's about that's what we teach. You know, those are the films and the filmmakers that we bring in. Um, we talk about the problematic aspects of that. You know, someone like Cassavetes is kind of problematic in terms of production process. Um, on the one hand, very inclusive, very open, but also kind of very demanding. You know, what does that mean? But then someone like Varda, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, what a joy it would have been to make films with Agnes Varda, you know, who just who was just so empathetic and so interested and curious and humane, um, despite you know, getting very little support throughout her career. Um, there are beacons out there that show you that you can make films and talk to people like human beings and you can treat them with respect. And we can do that. You know, we can do that as it, through this project. Um, and that's an act of resistance and that's an act of rebellion. And that's what it does is, well, just to, just to finish off, because I think it's important is that there's a kind of, I, this. there is an understanding, obviously, I'm not naive, like, film industry practice at the high level or even like independent film you know is high intensity high stress high stakes in terms of like moving parts constantly and it puts people in a certain edgy place and when we've sort of said to people we work with students or we work with recent graduates or whatever there is a kind of like oh shit you know <laughs> how's this going to work you know but there's a trust that comes from doing the work we've done as a film course, not as a film production course, but as a film course for a number of years. We built up a network of people who understand the ethos. They understand the course content. They understand what we teach, how we teach. And then that's like, OK, we'll give this a go because we trust you as people that you know what you're doing in terms of the culture that you're trying to build. And then they see what the students can do and the way that our staff interact with students. And they're like, it, it kind of relaxes them. You know, like the the producers that put testimonials in were just like, oh, this is, you know, so they'll come back because, again, it builds trust. You know, no one, a lot of the people we work with don't really want to work in the way they work, but that's the way it works. So it just moves them out of that space into a different space. The quality is the same. It's just that the process is is slightly different. Um, yeah, I, I went on a bit there because I that that's really important to me is how you do it. How you do it is really important. Like you. You know, and that's that's what we're in it for is to not be because I, I have a problem. Preparing students generally for a culture and an in, in an industry that is out to actively destroy them and replace them, you know, it's going It wants to use people up because it wants workers, you know, it wants people who are going to do something and then it's going to scale because they know that it's a it's a conveyor belt. They're not interested in those as people. They're not interested in what they have to say. It's like, do the job, do the job. And if you get burnt out, someone will take your place. It's how it's been for a very long way. And it just doesn't need to be that way. Um, and I have a problem saying to students, this is what you're going out for. So offering an opportunity to say, there are other ways of doing it. And these are the time. And, and one of the things that comes up is these are the places where you can push back. We've had that quite a lot where students are like, I feel uncomfortable on this. I'd like to say something. And we're like, say something, you know. You can walk off this set. <laughs> you can leave this production. This is not this. We do not sanction this. We do not endorse this. We've pulled off our name off projects when it's become clear that the directors, particularly the directors, um, are are not behaving appropriately. They're not behaving ethically. So it's like you're, this is no longer a lab project. And also our students do not have to work on this if they don't choose. And also, like if you've got an issue that wasn't raised at the time, we had one where students were driving back a long way. They hadn't necessarily made it clear where they how they were putting together their their travel. They didn't raise it to the production any they could. They came to us and we had a conversation and the producers were like, you should have raised this. We would have solved this, you know, but it was a good conversation. It's a productive conversation, even though it was quite tense. But that's learning. That's the process and giving them the confidence to say, if you think you're not being treated fairly, you can talk about it. And we have put you in a position where you can talk about it to us or you can talk about it to the producers or the direct you know and that's that's really important because and that changes as well people like you know and, and the producer on that feature was like okay well i'm going to make sure i know this next time you know? there's also you know? a knock-on effect then in terms of their own productions because what we find is that somebody who's been ethically being a runner on a larger production they're going to be a much better producer for the work they do with students and they'll take they'll do that more ethically or they'll it'll be you know front in their minds 
Thank you so much, both of you. I'm aware of the time. I know we only have about um, seven minutes and uh, two questions in the public, and I have two questions which I might or might not be able to squeeze in. So I'm going to um, ask Matthew to ask his question first, if that's OK. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, that was uh, brilliant. I really love what you're, you're, you're doing there. It's, it's really inspiring. Um, I have a question around, um, in terms of the kind of practices research, um, around maybe the restructuring the language of, of cinema and the grammar of cinema. I'm involved in a project that's around, it's called the International Network of Experimental Fiction Filmmaking, which is about getting people that are working within academia and industry to who are doing interesting stuff with the form of fiction filmmaking. And I think that that chimes with some of the stuff that you're doing, I think maybe conceptually. Mm. And I think in terms of playing with language and actually reconstructing the language of, of older grammar of cinema offers really interesting opportunities around sort of the ideas of decolonization, I guess, um, and producing producing a film language that isn't mimicking Hollywood. And mm. we always go back to Edward Said's assertion that cultural adaptation leads to ideological pacification. And working in your way is can be really emancipatory, I think, and radical in that sense. And I wondered if you could talk on that a little bit, because um, I think yeah, there was certainly lots of really interesting things at the beginning of your presentation around that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's still a goal that we haven't necessarily met. You know, we can be quite comfortable with Mark <laughs> as a kind of figurehead in that space, but it's definitely an ambition that we haven't quite unlocked yet. And I think that that's where particularly a doctoral program that we're sort of looking to put together would definitely come in in terms of inviting practice research in that space um, for doctoral study um, and and ideally working with more filmmakers who would be interested in that you know um, so sort of going out and working with people who are, who are doing that work um, so if, if, that, if that's part of your project you know I'd be happy to it'd be great to talk to you in terms of like how we might work on in that space because I think that's that is an ambition to to make work that feels more like those filmmakers I mentioned, rather than, you know, just the the process and the spirit. I think, yeah. Amazing question, Matthew. I would like to. Yeah, loved it. Continue this afterwards at some point. Uh, Vesna, I think you're you're next. Um. Yes. Hi. Uh. Thank you very much for the great talk. Um. Just on something you were you were mentioning a bit earlier. Um. Uh, it was. It is good to know that the students can come back to you if they experience, if they had bad, bad experiences on set. And I'm, I'm sort of. I would be keen to hear more about the support mechanism you may have in place. But my question is, maybe more practical, is just around um, how large is your team in the lab? How many of you actually work there? And uh, and I'm also wondering how many projects do you have active at any one point? Like, you know, what's the process of deciding what's the projects that you're working on and how large is your team? You're going to stress me out now, Vesna. Sorry. Um, it's all right. There's, no. well, there's, so there's, there's three of us with kind of core roles. So I'm the research and strategy lead. Laura's the production lead and then Kingsley Marshall is the development lead. Denzel Monk is part of the project team and then Paul Mulraney is part of the project team. They're people whose work sits within that. At, that's at present, but it's always open. So there's only really three of us that are active all the time in terms of the slate of products. I mean, just with Bacena alone, there's six features, plus there's the doc rows, so that's seven features that I'm involved in at various stages. Kingsley's got three features in development, plus the short. Laura's got God knows how many. Um, Severed Sun, your own feature, Ed's Eight. feature, Paul Pre. Um, and then the stuff that's kind of still active because it's going into post. So it's probably about 20 to 30 shorts, projects yeah. in various forms um, that we're covering across. But obviously, like, they're, they're, they're in, like, page one treatment through about to finish post-production. Um, and then there's yeah there's Paul's got his own projects which are kind of the archive stuff, so yeah um, yeah it's a lot um, it's which again goes back to Agatha's massive... first question of like sorry just goes back to Agatha's first point of like it makes sense to to make it teaching and make it research because if it's separate if you're doing twenty projects and you also got to research and you've also got to teach like it's a nightmare so that was the thinking has always been how can we bring all this stuff. So we're doing as little as possible that's different. You know, it becomes teaching, it becomes research, it is practice. 
um, makes it kind of manageable, but it makes it exciting as well because mm. it's, it's usually a fun part of every day. I was just going to say it's it's worth noting that we have a really great relationship with Screen Cornwall, who are a tremendous yeah, support well, yeah. in this. Um, and we're we're lucky in that because we've got quite a large technical facility and we've got, you know, in terms of production studios and kit, we have a production manager who also helps. We have, you know, stores team who also assist in, in really, really, really vital ways because it's it's part of the it's not just student labor. Sometimes it's post-production facilities, sometimes it's kit, sometimes it's, you know, the variety of things. So we've got a and lot lecturers, of people lecturers using uh, research time as well to work yeah. on practice stuff. So, yeah. Wonderful. Loads. Well, thank you so much. I'm aware that Neil has to go in one minute, so I think it's a good time for me to wrap it up right now. So thank you. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for contributing to the conversation as well. Uh, there's lots of Thanks questions. Thanks for accidentally we ending up here. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's lots of questions we didn't manage to ask and answer, but hopefully this conversation can continue in one way or another. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I'll publish this uh, recording by the end of today, and I hope to see everyone at the end of uh, next month, on last Wednesday of whatever is the next month, I think April it is, uh, for our next uh, seminar series. But thank you so much, Neil. It has been absolutely amazing to have you here today. Thank you for all your wonderful expertise and uh yeah have have a great evening everyone thank you so you much too. and yeah come visit or drop us an email happy to talk more bye everyone thanks so much thank you bye, bye, -bye. thank you bye